Hi, I am Court, and I'm from Jacksonville, Florida, and you're listening to my mom on Two Broads Talking Politics. Hey everyone, this is Kelly with Two Broads Talking Politics, and I am on with Sunny Gettinger, who is in a runoff for the Jacksonville City Council in District 14. Hi, Sunny. Hi, Kelly. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, thanks for joining me today. Uh, so you have an excellent name for running in uh, Florida, I think. <laughs> Yes, I have been told that once or twice <laughs> on this journey. And I absolutely love your logo. I think uh, it's just beautiful. Well, I, I should say that I'm very lucky. There was a, a graphic artist, uh, Karen Kariki, who's local here in Jacksonville, who, although she does a lot of work outside. And she actually came to me and was like, you know, I think we can do really incredible things with this brand and you have to let me be a part of this. And I'm, I'm so grateful. Um but I think, you know, this is, I've met so many incredible women. This is not just about me. This is about our whole community. And I'm really lucky to have um, all these folks helping me get there. I love that. So can you uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself and, and why you decided to run for city council? Sure. So I have lived in Jacksonville for about 10 years. I'm the mom of two boys. My husband and I actually moved here as newlyweds. So both of my children were born here. Um, and Court is a seven-year-old. He's a second grader at West Riverside Elementary School, which is a public Title I school in our neighborhood. And Max is um, four and we'll be joining him in kindergarten next year. And when I moved here, I, you know, my parents were family physicians. I'm originally from rural East Tennessee, and they they really showed me how you live in a community. So we moved there because my mom was in the medical health service corps. They were doctors, and I think they thought they would just be there for a few years because we're Jewish. There were not a lot of Jews in our town. <laughs> we were we were the only family. And so I think they thought they would move to someplace with a larger Jewish community eventually, but there was just such a great need. Um, they really got to work and built a practice that was designed to meet the full needs of families in the community. So whether it was mental health, they, they hired uh, licensed clinical social workers who who were able to meet a need that had never been served before in the community. They got specialists to come down from Knoxville, which was a big city about an hour away, um, so that people didn't have to take full days off to go get an appointment at a cardiologist or to get their mammogram. And that was the way that I was sort of taught. You live in a community, you go, you figure out how you can be helpful and you get to work. And so when we moved to Jacksonville, you know, one of the great things about um, living here was that I got to be involved as a volunteer, and I did that in various neighborhood organizations. I was the chair of the Riverside Arts Market, which is a local Saturday icon um, here. I was the chair of the Riverside Arts Riverside Avondale Preservation, which was which is another sort of neighborhood. It's our neighborhood organization, and it's a historic neighborhood. And through that, I, I sort of got to know how city council worked um, and and what kinds of things came before that. Um, and then I was on um, in my full-time job. I worked for Google, and I have for 12 years. And I was lucky enough to be working to try to bring Google Fiber here. So I really got to sort of see and where the city was on infrastructure and development and how we were handling permitting and all of those things. And so I was also working with Tampa at the time. So I sort of saw where the two cities were against each other. And the, that project got paused right about the time about the time Hurricane Matthew hit. And then we had Hurricane Irma a year later. And I, you know, I really saw where we were on infrastructure. And I thought everybody else would see where we were on infrastructure. And I thought we would start to put those 40-year plans, getting our utilities underground, dealing with the drainage issues that we knew came up even when it rains a lot, not just when we have major storms. And I just didn't see that activity. So that was really sort of what drove me to run because I was like, well, at least we're going to have a discussion about it, about the fact that we need to be doing some of these things that are not quite as sexy, but really are about how we can build a stronger city from the ground up and figuring out how to pay for some of these high ticket items um, that, that are expensive, but also are things that bring generations of jobs and improve property values and all of those sorts of things. So that's what sort of got me in the race. 
Excellent. So, uh, you know, we talk to a lot of people running for office around the country who talk about uh, the importance of broadband internet and, you know, how that can really help communities. You have sort of a, a unique view of that. Can can you talk a little bit about what what getting high speed internet into an area can can do and and what sorts of things Jacksonville still needs to do to sort of move forward in being a, a really connected community? Well Jacksonville actually, you know, we do have folks who are doing high speed internet here, um, not Google Fiber, but other other folks. And I know that our our public utility is actually looking at how they can help make that access go faster. You know, really and truly, at, at broadband is is has become a utility. Um, our houses run. It's not just the things that you expect to be connected. There's so many things that are connected that you don't expect to be connected. You know, I'm out knocking doors, and you know, every third house has a ring doorbell. <laughs> so you know, our lives are really connected. But it, it so. There's that. There's just the demand side of it. But then there's also the opportunity side of it, which is, you know, when when people have more access to the Internet and, and it, you have to couple that with also access to ways to, you know, with with devices, access to devices, and you have to couple that with literacy skills. So when you can have that perfect sort of that perfect grouping together so that you, a community is taking on all of those challenges simultaneously, you really can see opportunity. You can see, you know, the idea of economic opportunity bridged across many, many different places. And and we talk a lot about digital inclusion at this point, but it's, it's really about helping people figure out not just that they have access to the internet, but what do they do once they have it? So as you're going around and knocking on doors, and I've seen some pictures on your social media of how beautiful it is in Jacksonville knocking on doors. Yeah, it's, you have snow right now, right? Yeah, we do. <laughs> it was 90 degrees here yesterday. So. What are you hearing from people? What are people telling you or the, the issues that they're really concerned about? What are they thinking about, you know, the opportunity to have a new person representing them on city council? You know, I mean, I have to say I was I was. I had knocked doors for other people before, and I was a little scared when I started this process. I was like, gosh, it's so different to go up and knock for yourself and say, hi, you know, I want you to vote for me. Um, but actually, it has been the most amazing experience. And I know because I've listened to your to other of others of your podcast that almost everybody has this experience when we start this process. But, you know, people want to talk about what is truly important to them in their lives. And I always open with like, what are your concerns? What keeps you up at night? What are you thinking about? And, you know, what's been amazing is that the things that are mostly keeping people up at night are incredibly hyper-local. They're things like, well, you know, when it rains a lot, this street turns into a river, and it can stay like that for days if the sun doesn't come out. Um, and we've crawled, and we don't seem to be getting a lot of traction. Or, you know, they changed the traffic pattern on the two large streets on either end of this street. And so now this this street has become a, a pass through for people to avoid that. And it, people are going, you know, 35 miles an hour through a residential street with my child playing in the yard out front. Or it's things like, well, this neighborhood has always been, you know, very quiet and residential. And lately we've seen a lot of commercial development and we don't really understand where it's coming from and we don't know what's going on downtown. How do we find out what's going on downtown before the permit? cut up. So I really think like for a lot of folks, it's a, it's it's just dealing with stuff that they make keeps them, you know, they're scared about letting their kids go out and play in the yard. They're, they're worried about, you know, what it's going to mean if they put in a whole bunch of box stores within a couple of miles of their house, or not even a couple of miles, a couple of blocks of their houses. And I think that one of the things that I've learned is that communication, um, even in this age of 24 hour news, um, communication between government and the people they're representing is still pretty limited, and we have to be better about that and more directed and make it easier for folks. And that's actually a, a great place for technology to come in because almost everybody is connected somehow. So how can you help them make sure that they can find the information that they want when they want it in an easy way? And do you have ideas on on what sorts of ways that might be, ways that the city council and the, the residents can communicate better? Yeah, I mean, some of it is very basic. I mean, it gets back to the idea of just, you know, I intend to, if, if I'm elected, I'm going to have a 
biweekly newsletter that has a list of all of the permits that were pulled in our district and the list of any hearings that are associated with those permits so that people can figure that out by address. In the future, I'd love to see a system where you could actually sign up for that uh, and it would all be automatic. You would receive it in your inbox, but I think that we're a little bit of further away from that. So some of there's some of that. And then I would, I'm planning to do like do regular town halls in different parts of the district. Our districts are really large here. Jacksonville, for those of you people who might not know, is actually the largest city by area in the lower 48. So um, we have a really large district here. And so it's important to make sure that you're getting to all the neighborhoods. Um, and I think that's another, another thing that I've sort of heard that, you know, because of the shape um, and the way that it, it's usually the, the neighborhood that's closer to downtown sort of sometimes dominate. So it's really important to make sure you're getting out into all of the neighborhoods. I mean, I discovered as a part of this process that we actually have cows in District 14 in the middle of Jacksonville, <laughs> Florida. I never knew, but I was doing a ride along with with the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office just to sort of see where we were at. And around one in the morning, we got a call and he was like, oh, we got to go put the cows back in. I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and there we were putting cows back in. Wow. I, I wonder if there's cows anywhere in Chicago that I should know about. <laughs> well, I mean, you were a cow town to begin with. Yes, it's true. <laughs> we might have gotten rid of the cows after the fire. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> For Mrs. O'Leary. Yes. So tell me a little bit about the city council then. I, I noticed that you actually run with party affiliations uh, on mm -hmm. the ballot, which is, is different than what some other cities do. I know in Chicago, although everyone's a Democrat, technically there's no parties listed on, on city ballots. What what sort of dynamic does that bring to the city council? You know, it's interesting because I think we would have said previously that it didn't really, I mean, I wasn't aware of who was an R and who was a D on city council, despite the fact that we run and it is technically a partisan race. Um, I think, you know, the national climate has changed that a little bit and it's, it's made it a little bit more obvious locally too. I think I've been saying a lot, especially on the local level, there, nobody has a monopoly on good ideas, not Republicans and not Democrats. And that it's really important that, you know, asking questions, that that's not a hostile act. That's how you get to good policy. And so it really shouldn't matter who's presenting the idea. You should be willing to ask the hard question if you're sitting in that chair. Um, and that's what I'm running to do. Um, I think, you know, it's if you look at the effect of nationalization of local politics, I, I think it, it can be very detrimental to to the structure and fabric, not just of the council, but of the whole city, because really and truly, these are people you're going to walk down the street and see all the time. You see these people in the community. So most of us don't know if our neighbors are Republicans and Democrats. And that's what the council is. We're all neighbors. <laughs> so we really just need to be focused on getting getting things done, finding the right solutions, finding solutions we can afford, and and working for the residents of the city to make it as great as it can possibly be. So I also have a seven-year-old and four-year-old boys, and uh, I know how much work that can be. <laughs> so uh, tell me what your kids think about you running for office and, and how they're uh, helping out with the campaign to the extent that seven- and four-year-old boys can help out with campaigns. Um, well, my seven-year-old is really into it, and I think he's kind of a budding politico. <laughs> We were heading out a couple of days before the primary or the general, the run, whatever, the first election. And he, we're in the car to go sign wave for rush hour at a, at a busy intersection. And he's like, mommy, his name's Court. I really, really want you to win, but I do not think Max does. And I was like, I, I think you're right. Max does not want me to admit when Max had discovered that, um, city council met more meetings and he, he is anti any meeting. <laughs> And then he said, you know, mom, there's really no skill or strategy to democracy. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what? Who told you that? He was like, I've just been observing. But he's pretty into it. Like He went he went door to door with his dad and he was all about minivan. And on Sunday I said, hey, guess what? We arranged a play date. You don't have to go out canvassing today. And he was like, but I wanted to use minivan. <laughs> so he, he really is he, – when he's in a mood, you know how seven-year-olds are. Like, when he's in the right place, he is, like, the best person out there for my campaign, for sure. And, you know, he truly believes in me. 
my my four year old I think is a little bit um definitely it's been harder on him. Um but I've really made an effort to either be home for dinner or for or for um bedtime. I'm not a hundred percent on that. I can't make it every single night, but I I have a pretty good track record of being home either for bedtime or dinner. And so I'm just trying to make sure that they get they get the mommy side of me too. I've definitely, if you ask me what my biggest regret is through this whole thing, I would say I've missed more baseball, soccer, basketball games than I would have liked. I've made a lot of them, but I, I've missed a few. And I was the mom who was always there and, you know, cheering vociferously, embarrassingly loud. <laughs> <laughs> well, perhaps our seven-year-olds should get together and, uh, I don't know, form a pack or something. <laughs> Court would love that. I think he would enjoy a conference call. So like we could set that up for sure. He has lots of ideas about what you do on the second. He had like whole targeting plans for <laughs> how to handle what happens in the runoff after the after the general. He's like, so here's how I think you should target it. Here's who I think you should be talking to. And I'm like, okay. We're going to have you spend less time at the campaign headquarters. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently he was handing out my card to his his friends at school saying like, you live from nearby, right? You should have your mom and dad vote for my mom. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Is there anything else that you want to make sure that we talk about? Well, just I think, you know, one of the things I've heard you all say uh, on a lot of different ones is like, you know, mom's running, it's hard because your kids do, you know, you are going to pay a price as a family, but you're also going to get something as a family. And I think that we have learned so much about ourselves and this has been such a great opportunity to to pass on to our kids how much we care about the city that we live in and how much we want to be a part of deciding what happens and that they have the opportunity to do that too and that it's not just about the person running because they see all of our friends many of their friends and people who were not our friends who are becoming our friends and how that can sort of um drive change regardless of the outcome of the election and so i think for moms who are out there who are thinking about, gosh, I'd love to run, but it just seems so hard from a time perspective. Like, I can't say it's not. It is hard. But your family will get something out of it, too. That's great. And if people would like to help out your campaign, how can they do that? Oh, my gosh. My my staff would be like, I can't believe you didn't already say votesunny.com 12 times. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yeah, I have a website, votesunny.com. I'm also on Facebook and Twitter, Sunny Gettinger for Jacksonville City Council District 14 and just Sunny Gettinger. But, yeah, uh, votesunny.com. And, yes, we would love to. Actually, obviously, donations are great. But also, anybody who's into making phone calls, you can make them from anywhere. We have people from across. My sister is making them in Wisconsin. <laughs> I know I have a couple of friends in Chicago who are making them too. So we would love to have some people help out with uh, with those as well and help us. So we're really worried about turnout for the runoff. Obviously, it's usually much lower than the first pass because there are many fewer races. Um, there's only five races that have gone to runoff and only anybody, the most anybody can vote on in Jacksonville is three. So we would love some help uh, getting people to the polls. And of course, if you live in Jacksonville, come on out and help. We'll knock doors. We'll, we'll put you to work. And when is the runoff? The election is May 14th, um, and early voting starts April 29th. All right. Excellent. We'll put your information up on our website so people can help out. And everyone should go to your website and look at your, your beautiful logo. And I have to say, I wouldn't have thought of the colors that you use as being, you know, sort of the colors that I, I would pick for a website, but I love them. The beautiful, the uh, yellow and orange, it's just so pretty. So. Well, they are my favorite colors, probably a factor of my name, but um, <laughs> I, I feel very lucky because I sort of shied away from them for that reason. And, and this graphic artist was like, let's just make this, you should own it. It should feel like you. So yeah, I love it. Lean into it. It's beautiful. And uh, it's really eye catching because so many campaign websites sort of look the same now. And this definitely has a, a unique look that is, uh, is really eye popping. Well, thank you so much. I will definitely let Karen know. And um, yeah, if, if you can, there's contact information. So if anybody's looking for a really great graphic designer, let me know. <laughs> All right. Well, Sunny, thanks so much. And uh, maybe we'll get our kids together uh, working on taking over the world. <laughs> I, I love that idea. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks. Thanks for listening to Two Broads Talking Politics. Our theme song is called Are You Listening? off of the album Elephant Shaped Trees by the band Immunuri, and we're using it with permission of the band. 
Our logo and other original artwork is by Matthew Wefflin and was created for use by this podcast.